Um, Gary, you probably see as many patients as, as anybody in the country uh, with this disease. Mm -hmm. uh, how many of your patients diagnosed with differentiated uh, thyroid cancer never progress to metastatic disease, if you can give us a sense? Well, um, a lot of them uh, <laughs> never progress to metastatic disease. So we're, we're really talking about a select population here. So um, in my practice, about half of them are sort of the patients that are going to end up seeing Nifa or Marsha or Manisha or Frank. Um, but half of them will never have the opportunity. And I have a very unique practice in that regard. Of those half that have been previously untreated that present with stage one and stage two disease, only a small portion of them are going to turn into those that we're really focusing upon in this discussion. So it's an important point that surgery is a very effective treatment for many patients with thyroid cancer, um, and especially when we talk about the differentiated thyroid cancers. When NIFA mentioned Herthel cell carcinomas and the tall cell variants of papillary thyroid carcinoma and the poorly differentiated thyroid cancers. When we see those patients initially, we know that they have a disease process that we're much more concerned about than those that have a one and a half centimeter thyroid mass that's a differentiated thyroid cancer. Yeah, the, the histology really does uh, make a difference and good, good points. Frank, now let's say we have uh, a patient with radioactive iodine refractory disease, uh, fulfilling the criteria that Manisha talked about for, for patients you would begin to think about systemic therapy. How do you choose um, between the available therapies uh, or clinical trials in, in this patient population? Yeah, that's, that's really a good question, Ezra. Um, and thanks for asking. I, I first want to say, um, when I started um, after my fellowship, um, my first patients coming with thyroid cancer was like, wow, I have nothing to offer you. It's like I dreaded seeing these patients come to the door. And mm -hmm. now it's so interesting in the you know, last few years, we are approaching having four new agents to be FDA approved, if not approved already. So um, that opens up a whole landscape of um, treatment options for people. So when people come in, um, I'm a big believer in, in clinical studies. Um, and I think it's important that we enroll patients so we, we learn and we can get approvals for such agents. So I usually talk to them about a clinical trial um, with a TKI. So we were active participants in the decision trial. Um, we currently have um, the trial with vandetinib versus placebo open at our center. Um, Limvatinib was um, presented at ASCO yesterday. The data um, was an active clinical trial. So I, what I do is I tell patients I like to try to maximize the amount of time that we can get with your um, progression-free survival. We explain that we can't cure this kind of cancer, um, but that we can actually make a difference um, by using these agents. So my preference is to start with a clinical study if a patient is interested, um, and then I will progress to serafinib um, or another TKI. Um, sometimes you have a difficult time getting the things approved um, based on insurances. Um, and then even off-label, I've used um, mTOR inhibitors. So before I even had the TKIs available or the um, clinical trials, uh, we'd give a simple um, oral cytoxin every other week, 50 milligrams, Monday through Friday, and daily rapamycin. And I've had some very nice responses with that. So um, those are various treatment options I give people. If they're not interested in a clinical trial, um, I'll basically start with serafinib because now that's the FDA-approved agent. That's great. And, and you're quite right. The options for these patients has expanded tremendously in, uh, in the last uh, several years, just a very short period of time. You mentioned Seraph.